Amen. You guys can take a seat. Well, my name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors at Revision. I'm excited to be here today. How about you? All right. Have any of you guys ever taken a wrong turn and ended up somewhere you did not want to be at all? It happens. And if you're not careful, you could accidentally drive one-sixth of the country in the wrong direction. Yeah. You could also take a road that isn't even a road. Uh, one time when my sister first got her license, she drove across town to watch some kid she had a crush on play baseball at a different high school, and she got into the parking lot and then realized there was like a road that went down closer to the baseball field, and so she took it, and it wasn't until she popped up over a hill and bam, there were the bleachers and the fields, and everyone turned and looked at her, and there were people walking in the road that she realized she had just taken a sidewalk about a quarter of a mile. And she didn't think she could like reverse all the way back out of there. And so her friend told her, you got to do a three-point turn. And after a couple unsuccessful attempts, she realized she didn't know how to do a three-point turn because apparently she was sleeping the day they taught driving in driver's ed. So she had to get out of the car, switch places with her friend. Her friend did the three-point turn, and then they drove the sidewalk back up to the parking lot where all the other cars were. Like sometimes a wrong turn can be pretty embarrassing. And sometimes it can be even worse, it can be painful because wrong turns derail our hopes and dreams and leave us in a place we never wanted to be. We're sitting here this morning at the beginning of a brand new decade and we've kicked it off with this series, How to Start a Decade, where we've been talking about the journey all of us are on from who we are to the fullness of who God created us to be. Trying to help us connect the dots between the dreams he placed inside of our souls and the path it's going to take to get there. And I've been challenging all of us to begin taking some steps down that path. And there's no time like today to, to start doing that. Because even if it's intimidating and you feel like you have a long way to go, the old Chinese proverb is true. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. Step by step is how we get everywhere we go in life. But that reality is kind of a double-edged sword. Like a thousand miles one step at a time will take me a thousand miles from where I am today. But if I head in the wrong direction, if somewhere along that journey I make a wrong turn and I aim my life down a road other than the road that leads to who God made me to be, I could end up 2,000 miles away from where I wanted to be, a long way from where I am now, but even further from where I was meant to go. And so it's important that we're intentional about the direction we choose in life. It's important to take stock of where we're going. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Over the course of this series, we've been kind of taking a look at, at these questions that I wish I would have learned to ask myself sooner. I call them my dashboard questions because they're gauges and warning lights in my life that help me understand who I am and who I'm becoming. And they're not all the questions you could ever ask yourself, and they're certainly not a roadmap to perfection. That's not what they're doing in my life, but hopefully they're a helpful way of learning and seeing and taking stock of whether I am becoming the person God created me to be. And we kicked off the series talking about this question, what's my posture? Am I approaching tasks and people with a posture of pride or humility? And then we talked about the question, who are my people? Like relationships and vulnerability are tough, but it's even tougher to do life and faith on our own. So we need to find people to journey alongside. And then last week, Jody was up here and she talked about the question, how am I chasing my purpose? And it was awesome. If you weren't here last week or you missed it, you got to check that out online. It was great. And this morning, I want to close the series by taking a look at this last question, which is where do my patterns lead? Like where do my patterns, my habits, my routines, the disciplines and systems of my life lead? And it's a profound yet important question that's sometimes easier to answer than it seems. And for me, it's kind of a question that starts at the end and then works its way backwards. Take a look at who, who it is that I want to become and then figure out whether that's what I'm becoming. Like right here at the beginning of a decade, if God gave me, if God gave you a pen and a blank sheet of paper and said, write your own story, the question is like, what would I write? Who would I be in, in 2030? And it'd probably be someone different than I am now, someone more like the fullness of who God made me to be. I'm mean, take a look back at, at 2010. Chances are your life has changed in dramatic ways since then, and it's going to change dramatically over the next decade as well. So it's important for us to stop and say, who is it that I want to become? 
And I think it matters that we start with that who question and then work our way back to the do questions. Because we live in a culture that sets a whole lot of do goals. We could hop on the internet and read endless articles about things that we ought to do if we want to be happy, if we want to be fulfilled, if we want to live the lives we're, we're meant for. We've got to do this and do that and do this and do this and eat that and, and do like an infinite number of things. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I live in the middle of that and I get bombarded with it and I feel overwhelmed sometimes. Like there are so many things I'm supposed to be doing and so many things I'm supposed to be not doing and I can't do it all. I don't even know where to start. It's just, it's too much. And that's why do goals are, are a bad place to start because the stuff that we do is just the method. Being and becoming all that God made us to be is the mission. So this dashboard question, where do my patterns lead, is, is functionally a question of, of whether our methods are serving our mission, whether the things that we're doing in our lives regularly and habitually are helping us become more like Jesus, more like we were made to be, like in every area of our lives. Take the area of family, for example. Like in family life, God blessed me with the ability to be a husband and a father, so I asked this question to help myself figure out whether I am becoming the husband and father that I want to be. In marriage, my singular goal, right, and this is who I believe God called me to be, is I want me and Jenny to want to be together. I want us to be where the other person, or want us to want to be where the other person is more than we want to be anywhere else. I know that's super savvy and corny, and half of you are like, oh, and the other half are like, eh, but I don't care, whatever. That's my goal. <laughs> Because I think if like, we want to be where the other one is more than we want to be anywhere else, we're probably nailing it at marriage. And with my kids, this is my singular goal. I want kids who want to be together and want to be with us even when they don't have to anymore. You may think, well, that's a small goal. You need more, better goals for your kids, like academic goals and athletic goals and achievement goals. Maybe I do, but whatever. I just, I think if that's who we are as a family, if in the end I am somebody that my wife and kids want to be around when they don't have to, like probably a whole lot of that other stuff I'm hoping for will fall into place around that. Now, please, for my sake, don't ask my wife or kids whether they want to be around me. Like, I'm trying to get there by 2030. This is how to start a decade. This is your long-term aspirational goals. But seriously, I, I believe that's who God created me to be. And so sometimes I got to sit back and say, are the patterns of my life leading me to that place? The amount of time I spend at work, the amount of time I spend looking at a screen while I'm at home, the amount of time I watch football on TV while I'm sitting at home, the way I'm investing in my kids' development spiritually and academically and emotionally and relationally, the type of faith I'm modeling for them, the things that I'm doing regularly to serve my wife and show her love, are those things leading me in the direction of being a guy that my wife and kids want to be around or, or are they not? And asking that question kind of gives me a roadmap of the stuff I probably need to keep doing, the stuff I definitely need to stop doing, and the stuff I maybe need to start doing in order to move like, from where I am toward the person God created me to be. And I think that's valuable for all of us sometimes, to just press pause in the middle of the busyness and craziness of our lives and ask where our patterns are leading. Because in life, the truth is sometimes there's a disconnect between the dreams that we're chasing and the direction that we're choosing. We have this idea of who we want to be, but sometimes the stuff we're doing isn't helping us get there. And sometimes it's even counterproductive. It's leading us even further away than we were before from, from who we want to be. And we all do it. We say, oh, I want to be married to a guy who's awesome and funny and fun and loves Jesus because I want him to love me well and love our kids well. But for now, I'm just going to date whoever asks me out, as long as he's cute. We say, like, I, I, I want to be healthy. I want to be someone who, like, enjoys retirement and enjoys my grandkids. But for now, I'm just going to eat whatever I want, drink a little bit too much, exercise for other people. You know, that's, that's not... For me, we say, I, I want to be out of debt, but I also don't want to drive a, a junky car and then you get made fun of it. Like, for now, it's just going to be a lifestyle. I want to be generous. I know that like, generosity is something I, I want to be 
identified by and God calls me to to give and he says when I when I bring my best to him it reflects who he is and and all that I'm made to be and I, and I kind of I owe him my first fruits and I want to be that but for now I got like student loans and a mortgage I like that's for now this is just how it's got to be so like I want to be a husband and a dad whose family knows how important they are to me but for now I just got to plug in all those extra hours at work I got to you know take every trip that they offer me because I got to keep making it up this ladder so I can make more money so I want to be a wife whose husband knows how important she is to me, but, or he is to me. But like for now, for now, I just can't make him a priority. I need him to just be my assistant parent for now. For now. I, I, want, to, I want to be someone who's connected with God, but for now, I just can't fit it in between work and extracurriculars and binging Netflix. Like, I want to be, but for now. I want to be, but for now. And it's really awkward in here right now because every single one of you feels like it just threw you under the bus. But good news, you're not alone under that bus. There's a whole pile of us. We're all under there. <coughs> it's where we live. Like this, I want to be, but for now, is the story of my life. I promise you. I, I used to, at one point in my life, have a whole collection of workout DVD programs that had never been viewed beyond the first 20 minutes of the first DVD. Like, I would just see these things on TV. I'd see like insanity and be like, oh yeah, I got to do that. And then I put it in, and a few minutes in, you're like, insanity, this was named correctly. This is, I made a huge mistake. I can't do this anymore. This is not what I want to do. And it's just so easy for us to slip into patterns that take us away from the life we really want and don't help us become all that God is calling us to be. And that's why I had to start asking myself this dashboard question. I had a sneaking suspicion that there was an unintentional disconnect in my life between the dreams I was chasing and the direction I was choosing. And for me, the, the biggest idea, the big purpose, and, and the main goal of asking and answering this question has always been connected to something Jesus said about who he is and who we're made to be in the book of John chapter 15. So if you have a, a Bible or a Bible with you this morning, you can open it up to John chapter 15. It's right between Luke and Acts. I don't know why, because Luke and Acts is like one big letter, so we shove John in the middle, but whatever. And John 15 is Jesus at the Last Supper, talking to his disciples. He's about to be arrested, about to be killed. The end is coming near, and he makes this statement to them about who he is. And he actually does that a lot in John. Over 20 times he uses this Greek phrase, ego I me. And ego I me means I am, which by the way is the phrase that God used when Moses asked him his name in Exodus 3, from the burning bush. God said, I am. And so every time in John, you read Jesus saying those words, ego I me, I am. What he's doing is not very subtly telling us that he's God. Stepped out of eternity into history, and at the Last Supper, he looks at his disciples and says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. And this is a word picture that made a lot of sense to all his disciples. They'd grown up in Israel surrounded by vineyards, and they knew how it worked. There's a vine, and there are branches that grow from that vine. And the vine is the source of life, and the vine is the source of nutrients. And some of those branches get the nutrients, and they produce grapes. And some of them produce nothing. And what the gardener does is prunes the healthy branches that are making fruit and cuts off the dead branches because they're doing nobody any good. And so that's what Jesus says. And then he continues in verse 4. He says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I love this verse. The word that we translate remain here is this Greek word meno. And meno means remain or abide or reside, but it's a little bit deeper than that. It has this connotation of putting down roots in a fertile place, like anchoring your life to a spot where you receive sustenance. And so when Jesus uses that phrase, when he says, meno in me, remain in me, what he's saying to his disciples is that if you want life, if you want purpose, if you want the nutrients that you need to be all that I made you to be, you got to anchor your life to me because I am the place where life is found. And then he continues, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. 
If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus' message here is so simple yet so powerful. He's saying, look, if you want to live the life you're made for, if you want to recognize your created creative purpose, that the God of the universe dreamed you up and knit you together and put you right where you are for, you got to connect to me. Because if you're not connected to me, eventually you're going to be cut off from that life. And you may be successful in the eyes of the world, but if you want to be successful at the things that really matter, relationship with me has to be a priority because that's where fruitfulness is found, where meaning and purpose and potential are truly realized. And so it's important for us to sit back and take a look at, at our lives and ask whether we're being connected to the vine. One of my best friends in seminary, this was his favorite passage in the Bible, he used to just ask me all the time, Mike, are you connected to the vine? Are you connected to the vine? And it's a valuable question uh, for you. Are, are you connected to the vine? And if you're not, what's it going to take to get connected? Because I think the truth of, of life, at least I, I've found this to be true, is that we're always moving one way or the other. We're never just like stagnated in faith for a really long time. We're either growing closer to God or falling away from Him. Whether we like it or not, whether we know it or not, we're always on the move for better or for worse. The great Greek philosopher Heraclitus put it this way, no man ever steps in the same river twice for it is not the same river and he is not the same man. Or if ancient Greek philosophers really aren't your cup of tea, the great American comedian Mitch Hedberg said it like this. I hate when people ask me, do you want to see a picture of me when I was younger? Every picture is a picture of you when you were younger. <laughs> Same big idea. Like change is inevitable. It just happens to us as human beings. So if we want to do what matters, if we want to change in the direction of, of fullness and hope and life, then we got to do a couple things. Number one, we got to stop doing the things that cut us off from Jesus. And number two, we got to start doing things habitually, regularly that connect us to Jesus. I mean, it's no secret that every single one of us in this room has some stuff we got to quit doing. We don't like it. We don't like to talk about it. But we all know that it's true. And, and I know probably better than anyone how easy it is to pretend like that stuff just isn't a huge deal. Like there's little stuff in our lives that, that we know we should quit, but it's not like really making a difference. It's just small. And it's shocking how easily we convince ourselves that little things don't make a difference. Like in every area of our lives. We decide we're going to go jog and we hop on the treadmill three times on a week and then we weigh ourselves and we gain two pounds. We're like, I quit. You know, we decide we're going to buy less coffee and at the end of the month we save 20 bucks. Pfft, I quit. I quit. We read our Bible five times in a week, and then on the drive to church, we lose it and scream at our children the whole way. I've never done that. It's because for most of the time I've had children, I've been a pastor, and I've long gone before Jenny has to take them to church all on her own. That's the only reason. But like, we do that, and we're like, this isn't working. I quit. Or the flip side, we get home, and there's laundry on the bed, and we know we can fold it, but we don't feel like it, so we just play video games for three hours, and then our wife comes home, and the laundry's still there, and she doesn't pack up and leave us, and we're like, huh, all right. You know, or we miss church for a Sunday. We don't feel completely spiritually empty. All right. We eat half a box of Krispy Kremes because they're delicious. And we would have ate the whole box, but someone else stole six of the donuts. And it was like, Bruh. and then the next morning we don't look any different in the mirror. Like, eh, no big deal. It's just so easy to convince ourselves that all this little stuff doesn't make a big difference. They're not, they're not like habits that are really hurting us or hurting anybody else, right? But I, like, I sit back and I realize... Nobody looks ahead of their life and plans to get addicted to drugs or alcohol or pornography. Like nobody plans to become selfish and alienate their friends, to be a workaholic whose kids can't stand them, to blow up their marriage, to have a heart attack, to go bankrupt, to feel depressed like they wasted their life. But tons of people do that stuff. All around us, our friends and our family members and ourselves, we, just, we see it happen all the time. And it rarely happens in one fell swoop. It's really hard to wreck your life overnight. And it's almost impossible 
to seize the life you want in an instant. It just, it just happens one step at a time, and our lives end up becoming the sum total of the small choices that we've made along the way. And so many of those choices are built as part of habits, patterns, and, and routines. And I want us to all understand this phenomenon this morning. The patterns you let in will become the patterns you're set in. Like the patterns you let in become the patterns you're set in. When we let them into our lives, eventually they just become habits, whether we intended for them to or not. And they determine who we are and where we go and what we become. And we talked about that a little bit this summer in this series called Time Travels, this principle I call the rule of the road, that you will eventually end up wherever the road you're on leads to. And we can wrap our minds around that, right? No matter what you feel like or how bad you want it, you will never, ever get to Chicago on Interstate 35. It just doesn't go there. <laughs> it's not how it works. And, and spiritually, it's the same idea. There are paths that just don't lead to the fullness of who God made us to be. They don't lead to connection with Jesus. But Jesus made it pretty clear to his disciples at the Last Supper that if we want to bear fruit, if we want to live lives of meaning and purpose and the impact we were made for, they're found in relationship with him, but not all roads connect to the vine. And so no matter how inconsequential we want to believe our habits are, and I totally do. I tell myself this all the time, and probably you do too. Like I I'd say, I'm going down this road, and I know this is just a detour. I'm not like taking a whole different road. It's just this thing that I shouldn't do, but it's just a little detour, and then I'll be right back on. And I think when we keep trying to sell ourselves on that idea that it's just a detour, what we'll eventually find is that our journey of a thousand miles started with a single step. And we're a long way from where we wanted to be, and the fruit of our lives is no good. And so it's important to be real honest with ourselves about the stuff we got to stop doing because it isn't helping us become who we want to be and who God says we were made to be. And it's important too to take a look at, at the things we're doing that are connecting us to Jesus. To keep doing and start doing things that, that plug us in, that put down roots, that meno, that remain in the source of, of life and hope and meaning and, and purpose. And we got to turn those things into things that we're doing regularly, into disciplines in our lives. Because if we don't, we're going to drift toward disconnection. It's almost impossible. It rarely happens that we accidentally drift toward Jesus, which creates a problem for a lot of us because like, most Americans make better plans for their next vacation than they make for their personal growth or their spiritual growth. But if we want to live lives of fruitfulness and meaning, then we got to embrace disciplines that draw us closer to the source. And I know as soon as I say the word discipline, some of us cringe because we've been beat up by that in the past. And disciplines feels like making ourselves do stuff that we really don't want to do. And then you were, add the word spiritual on the front of it, like spiritual disciplines. And that's intense. I don't know. As a kid, I can be straight with you. Every time I heard a pastor stand up on a stage and talk about spiritual disciplines, this is the only thing that ever went through my mind. I just pictured these guys. <laughs> It's like, I just thought, oh, great, that guy wants me to go to a monastery and hit myself while chanting in Latin. Looks like a barrel of fun. I was not sure if it's for me. But that's not what I'm talking about when I talk disciplines. Spiritual disciplines are otherwise. Like, disciplines are, are things that help us do eventually what we can't do right now. They're just tools in our toolbox that help us become eventually who we are not now. Realize some of the fullness of the potential, like the God-breathed potential that lives inside of us. And the reason they're kind of like a dirty word and, and something we hate in our culture is that we live in like a quick-fix society. We want what we want, and we want it immediately, which is why we're more prone than any culture in the history of the world to buy into the idea that like the right ticket or the right pill or the right strategy will like jump start us and and be our fast track to success but there's a problem with it it's like if, if I'm here and I want to get there I can't get to there from here without going through here and for most of us in most areas of our lives discipline is 
the way we get through here. And Jesus tells us, like, what's on the other side of that. What's on the other side of, of that, that pathway through here in John 15? Right after he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Remain, put your roots in me, you're going to bear fruit. In verse 11, he tells us this, I've told you this so that, you're, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. He says, look, you guys, I want to give you a bigger, better vision, a revision of, of who I am and who I made you to be so that you can live with joy, so you can be fully alive. This is what it's about, and this is what happens when you plug your life into me. And so the question for us this morning is how do we do it? Like what are, what are some of the disciplines and the patterns and the habits we can build into our lives that help us connect to the vine? We could do a whole series. We could spend months talking about spiritual disciplines. And someday we will. I love them. But I, I think what I want to communicate this morning is that as intimidating and scary as that phrase may sound, actually doing it is way less complicated than we make it out to be sometimes. It's way less complicated than the books at the bookstore make it out to be sometimes. There are a whole lot of simple ways that we can connect our hearts and our lives to the God who made us for himself. Prayer is one. Just like you talk to your friends, your family, your spouse, your kids, your boyfriend or girlfriend because you want to build a relationship, the God of the universe invites us to just talk to him. Reading the Bible is another one. We have this gift. We have the ability. We have access to God's self-revelation, this book that he gave us that tells us who he is. And in the 21st century, we have it in our pockets. Download the U version if you don't got it. And we have access to devotional books that help us like get a reading plan and explain what it is. It's a great way to connect to God. Worship. We're built to worship a God who's worthy and we make it a discipline, a priority. We connect with him and he changes us. Fellowship. We talked about this a few weeks ago. Sometimes it's hard and intimidating to connect with people because it's vulnerable and we don't like being vulnerable and some of us have been burned in the past, but life and faith are too hard to do on our own, and so sometimes we just need to do it as a discipline. Okay, I'm not sure I want to do this, but I'm going to make it a point to do life and faith alongside other people, because it's, it's going to get me further than I could go on my own. Invitation, we grow closer to God as we tell people about Him and invite Him in. Generosity, God does a crazy thing in our hearts when we come to Him with open hand service. Our faith grows huge in ways we never could have anticipated when we use like the unique gift set and the unique wiring he's given us to be a blessing to other people. There are all kinds of ways that we can connect with God. And, and my advice this morning, for all of us who are sitting here thinking, man, i got to build in some patterns that connect me more to Jesus because my patterns aren't leading where I want them to lead. My advice is this, start small and start specific. Just set a couple really small, really specific goals. Just like crash diets don't usually lead to long-term health. Crash Bible reading doesn't either. Do not try to read the whole Bible this week. You will not make it past Leviticus. I promise you'll die in Leviticus. And be like, I, There's so much camels. I can't read about how much camels Zebulun had anymore. I quit. Just don't do it. It's going to burn you out. Start some, set some small, specific goals. Because you guys, if Jesus really meant it, that the life we were made for, that joy and completeness and fullness is found in connection with Him, then we got to connect with Him. And the cost of building some of those disciplines into our lives is way smaller than the cost of missing out on His presence and, and His love. Because it's true. And just like, the, just like the patterns you let in become the patterns you're set in, I'm convinced that the disciplines you embrace become the character you showcase. Eventually, the disciplines that, that we build into our lives so we can connect more to the God who made us for connection with Him become who we are to the world around us. The author and psychologist Stephen Covey puts it this way, our habits will make us or break us. We become what we repeatedly do. I get that this is not easy. If I'm being real with you guys, this question is probably the most frustrating one for me personally of the, all the dashboard questions. It's the one I least like being honest with myself about because cutting out destructive habits and trying to take good things and make them not just things I do occasionally but things I do regularly is really hard and I don't always like it. A lot of times I hate it. My alarm goes off at 4.59 a.m. 
for one reason and one reason only. Because later in the day, when Jenny asks me to do stuff, I want to be able to say, I'm really tired. I got up in the fours. <laughs> she loves that, by the way. Me getting up at five and using a technicality to complain. I sort of try, try to spoil her with it daily. But like, here's the deal. I cannot remember the last time my alarm went off and I wanted to get out of bed. I don't ever. No, it's not even a thing that I could recall. I hate it. But my alarm is, is this song that's not even a good song and it's not pleasant to wake up to, but it's a song called I Want to Get Better because every day when I wake up and I hate that I'm awake and I don't want to get out of bed, I got to remind myself that unless I take some steps toward health, spiritually, first and foremost, and relationally, emotionally, physically, professionally, I'm, I'm going to miss out on the fullness of what God made me to be. And so I get up and I try to get better. And what I did not want to do when my alarm went off, I'm usually glad I did later. Not always, but usually. I think all of us know that feeling. Like doing things that, that we initially didn't want to do, but, but feeling glad that we didn't. So you guys, I want to just beg you this morning, please, for your sake, please for, for my sake, for the sake of everybody around you, figure out where your patterns are leading and find some patterns that connect you to Jesus. Because we need the fruit from your life. I mean it. I'm convinced that the Bible says over and over and over again that you are here, right where you are, crashing into all the people you crash into on a regular basis because God dreamed you up and knit you together and built you for this moment and this place and this space. And the world around you is dying for the fruit that your life has to offer. So let's figure out how we can do this. Because I think if we don't, if we don't stop sometimes and, and ask like where we're going and where our patterns are leading, we might end up in a place other than the one God has for us. We might find out that we thought we were going down a road, but at one point we took a wrong turn and we drove a long way down a dead-end sidewalk and everyone's looking at us and we're embarrassed and it's not where we want to go because the patterns we let in became the patterns we got set in. But if we do it and we make it a priority in our lives to figure out how to connect to Jesus, then those disciplines we embrace will become the character we showcase. We'll find life and we'll find meaning. We'll find fruitfulness and we'll find joy in the journey. Oh, you guys, I, just, I so badly, I don't want us to get to the end of life and look back filled with regrets and feel like life just happened to us. I want us to be people who look and say, I happened to life. I happened to it because I chased the purpose God has for me. And Jesus tells us that purpose is found in anchoring our lives to his love and, and his life. And when we do that, we do that, we find fullness and joy. So let's figure out our patterns this week and go be fruity. You guys pray with me? God, thank you. Thank you for inviting us to fruitfulness. Thank you for being a source of life and hope in all things at all times for, for us. Lord, we know we got all kinds of patterns in our lives, good ones and bad ones and things we got to stop and things we got to start. But we just thank you for being a God, like a creator of the universe who, who made us for connection with you. God, I'm just wowed and blown away by that invitation. And I pray that we'd accept that invitation this week so that you could do in us and through us all the things that you made us for. And we just thank you, thank you for the connection that you invite us into. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.